A couple years ago, I put out a video where I converted a drill press into a milling machine. I've used that for hundreds of projects over the past few years. Doing so, I've learned where the machine's strengths and where its weaknesses are. In today's video, we're going to upgrade the drill press mill. We're going to try and address some of those weaknesses. If that interests you, stay tuned, we'll get started. The first thing I want to upgrade on the drill press mill, I want to change the way the table is mounted to the press itself. Currently, it's supported on the drill press's original table, which is held to the column. So as I move the linear screw up and down, the table rides on the column and that's what holds it. It's locked in place with a clamp here on the column. Because I opted not to bolt it or mount it to the lead screw, and because there's nothing here to hold alignment, you get a lot of movement. That's not ideal. So I would like to remove it so that the table no longer mounts to this round column. My idea is to use a square column and mount the table on a pair of linear guide rails. I'm using some six inch by six inch, three eighths wall square tubing. I went with this because I think it'll be good and stiff, but also it provides a wide enough surface that I can mount linear guide rails to it. The further apart the guide rails are, the more support they'll provide in this direction. This tubing is 36 inches long. I need to cut it down to 18 to match the max travel on the drill press. I'm gonna use my metal bandsaw. This is wider than the actual capacity of my bandsaw, but I found if I cut it one side at a time, that it'll work. I'm using some linear guide rail made by THK to carry the table and maintain its alignment. The guide rail is way too long. So this measures 28 inches. I need to cut it down to 18. I'm just gonna use a cutoff wheel in my angle grinder to do that. Once I had it cut to length, I used a belt sander to put an even finish on the end of the guide rail. The six by six square tubing I'm using for the column, it's not perfectly flat. It's not the ideal surface for mounting the linear guide rail. So instead of bolting that rail to the column, I bought a length of six inch by one half inch ground steel plate. This is flat and smooth. It'll be a really good surface for the guide rail. So I'm gonna mount that plate to the column and then I'm gonna bolt the guide rail to that plate. So there are eight segments on this guide rail. So I am gonna install a bolt behind it in each one of these locations. These holes measure 60 millimeters in this direction and 24 millimeters apart in this one. So for mounting the back plate to the column, I'm gonna put a hole right in the middle. I am using some M8 low profile bolts. These have a really shallow head and I'm doing that so I can recess them into the back plate, but still give me a lot of material to bolt this down. The way I'm gonna install these, I'm gonna drill through both the plate and the column, the diameter four and eight millimeter tap. I'm then gonna remove the plate. I'm gonna tap the holes that are in the column and then I'm gonna bore out the holes in the plate and I'm gonna use the end mill to run a countersink. I used a 5 8 end mill to cut the countersink bores. Unfortunately, it went dull after six holes. I guess you should spend more than $12 on an end mill. At this point, I was kind of frustrated, so I gently placed it outside so it could be amongst its friends. I then laid out some guidelines and I cut the countersink bores by hand. Each one of these linear guide rails is held in place with 16 four millimeter bolts. They have to be really accurately located. To do that, I aligned one rail with the edge of the plate. I drilled and tapped it and bolted it firmly down. I then clamped the second rail in place and confirmed alignment with a dial indicator. Once I had it correct, I drilled, tapped, and bolted that second rail. One thing you'll notice as I tap and thread in these bolts is that my hands shake. I suffer from essential tremors. My hands shake anytime I try to do anything that requires fine movement. I'm always concerned I'm gonna break one of these tiny taps because my hands shake. Fortunately, I was able to tap all 32 holes without issue. I wanna be able to adjust alignment between the mill and the base when it's assembled. So instead of welding the column to the base, 
I'm going to bolt it in place. That will allow me to make fine adjustments using shims. I made the flange for mounting the column to the base using some half inch steel plate. I cut it down to 8 inches square and I drilled half inch holes in each corner. Those holes will bolt it down to the base. To maintain alignment between the column and the base, I bolted the new mounting flange to the base. I then aligned the column with an angle finder and bolted it down with a chain. When everything looked good, I fully welded it in place. Once welding was done, I used the needle scaler to remove slag and to put a nice finish on the flange. I'm going to make the new table out of some hot rolled steel. I've got a lot of this stuff laying around. I bought it in the past for other projects that didn't pan out. There are a couple of big problems with using hot rolled steel though. The first is mill scale. This stuff is covered in a hard coating that is formed when it's made. It's incredibly difficult to remove. The other is that it's not very square. So this is a 12 inch by 6 inch piece. It was cut with a shear, so when they do that they tend to bend it. So if you look at this, it's got a bend on the end. And then because it is made by rolling it between rollers, it tends to have a wave to it. So if I put a square here, you can see that rock. So to use this, we're going to have to remove that mill scale and then we're going to have to square it up. So here's how the table back plate turned out. I used a 3 inch fly cutter to get it flat and then a 2 inch shell cutter to mill the edges to clean those up. This is going to bolt to the linear guides, kind of like so, and then will support the rest of the table. So the table will bolt to this and then this bolts to the guides and then our work table will sit about here. These are the guides I'm using. They've got six bolts per guide and there's four guides. So that's 24 bolts that I'm going to have to drill holes for to mount the table. That's a lot of bolt holes to get in the right spot. I could manually measure these, lay them out and punch each one, but I run a real risk of getting some of these in the wrong spot. And if I do that, it's going to make a real mess. So instead of doing that, I carefully measure the bolt pattern and I drew up this guide in SOLIDWORKS and then 3D printed it. This let me confirm that my measurements were correct. And now I've got a plate that I can use as a jig when I drill the back plate. So this jig is made from PLA plastic. Once you start drilling, the heat and the chips will melt it. Not a big deal though, because at that point you've already got the hole started and the jig doesn't do much. So here's how that table turned out. I was able to mill it flat using a 3 inch shell cutter. You can see where the welds are. So these were the holes that I welded shut. The welds are harder, so when the cutter ran over them it resulted in a slightly different surface finish for the welds. If we flip this over, looking at the back side here, I milled out a couple spots. So this back portion will allow the back plate to bolt and be square. So I machined that out so I'd get a good fit there. And then this center portion will carry the mounting bracket for the linear screw. So this is going to bolt in place here and then the screw will thread on and be attached to this point. So you just saw me make parts for my drill press milling machine using a real milling machine. It's kind of a chicken and egg thing, right? So to make the mill, I need the mill but I probably don't have the mill to make the mill. I'm assuming if you're watching this video, if you're watching converting a drill press into a mill, you probably don't have one of these. The only reason I really used this was to square up that cheap hot rolled steel. You don't have to do that. You can go to McMaster Car and buy some of that pre-ground, pre-finished steel. It's the stuff I use to mount the guide rails to. If you get that, it's already square. You don't have to square it up. So if you use that stuff, you don't need this machine. I'm going to bolt the table together instead of weld it. The reason being that I went to a lot of trouble to mill the table to get it square. If I weld it, it's going to distort, it's going to no longer be square. So if I bolt it together, I don't have to worry about that. This table is going to be bolted together in three places. So I'm going to start by bolting the top to the back. Once that's done, I made a pair of ribs. 
and I'm going to put these ribs in place and they're going to be bolted to the top and then to the back. So I've got this set up here, kind of an odd arrangement, but I think it'll work. So I clamped the back plates into the vise, and then I used a pair of 90 degree angle plates to align the top to the back so it's square. I clamped those in place, but then I also used bolts in through the back that go in through the holes for the guides. Once I had that in place, because there's a lot of weight on this vise, I added a couple of machinist jacks and this round column here to support the weight. So I'm going to use the mag drill. We're going to start and we're going to drill the back here and bolt the top to the base. So I've got the new column now mounted to the stand and I have fitted the work table, it's bolted in place. What I need to do now is I need to tram this head to the table. Because this is a new table, these two aren't necessarily square. The way I'm going to do that, I drilled and tapped some holes in this square column and I threaded in some bolts. Those bolts squeeze or clamp the round column in place. So I've fitted a dial indicator into the chuck. And my plan is to sweep that dial indicator across the table and then use these bolts to change the position of the round column until I get the same reading in all points on that dial indicator. When that happens, I will know that the head is then square to the table. All right, so I think I've got this just about right. As I swing the dial indicator around, I've got about a 10 micron swing between the three corners. I don't think I'm going to be able to get any better than that with this table. So now that this is aligned and it's trammed and I'm happy with it, I am going to fill the column with epoxy. So I'm going to mix up an epoxy sand mixture. I'm going to fill the square column and the round column. And that mixture will pretty much turn this into a solid piece. I'm going to fill this column with epoxy granite. I found a video by Metal Musings. His best recipe used epoxy, gravel, and dust from his sandblaster. I don't have the dust part, so I'm substituting some steel abrasive media. This is more coarse than I expected, but I think it'll still work. I'm using a recipe that is 50 pounds of steel grit, 16 pounds of gravel, and half gallon of epoxy. So this mixture added 67 pounds of weight to the column. I am using one-to-one -one tabletop epoxy. I went with this because I've used it in the past, and it's really cheap for what you get. To make sure that everything is mixed correctly, I mix the epoxy in one bucket and the grit and gravel in another. And then I poured those two buckets together and mixed it until I had an even consistency. To fill the column, I found what worked best was just to scoop it out by hand and push it into the column. I filled both the square and round columns with epoxy. Once set, this turned into one single column. It feels really stiff and I also think it's going to be good at damping vibration. If I take a metal tip on this screwdriver, it does not ring like a bell. I'm really happy with how the epoxy granite turned out. I let it cure for a few days and then I brushed on a top coating of epoxy. I did that because I planned to paint this and I thought having a smooth coat of epoxy, I could scuff that and paint it and it would give me a better surface finish. The second upgrade I want to make is I want to replace the head. There were a lot of comments in the original video that pointed out that this Walker Turner head wasn't ideal. So I am going to replace it with this one. This is a Rockwell 15 inch drill press head. It's got a lot of advantages over the Walker Turner. The big ones, the spindle does not stick down as far from the main casting, so it'll have more support, should be more rigid. The second, the casting is a lot larger and it's hollow, so it should be more rigid and I can fill it with epoxy. And then the third, the quill is quite a bit larger on this machine than it was on the Walker Turner. So I can actually fit tapered bearings into this spindle whereas this one I could not. So replacing the Walker Turner with the Rockwell I think is going to be a good solution. I like to put out projects like this in one video. I want you guys to see everything from start to finish in one shot. 
This year though, I've signed up for four bicycle races this summer. I'm not going to have a lot of time for projects like this. So unfortunately, we're going to have to make this a two-part video. In part one, we modified the column, we built a new table and we put it together. In part two, we're going to tackle the head. We're going to modify the spindle and fit some tapered bearings. We're going to fill it with epoxy and then we're going to put it through its paces. So we're going to cut some aluminum, some steel, we'll try and use a fly cutter, that sort of thing. And we'll compare its performance to the old Walker Turner. If you're subscribed to my channel, keep an eye out for that. If you're not subscribed, consider subscribing so when that video is ready and that video is out, you'll know about it. So that's it for today's video. Thank you for watching. I'll see you later.